Okay, so what we're going to do today is we are going to take a look at a couple of examples of nomenclature in order to you know, get a little bit more practice um, you know, in our, give us, give us, to get a little more practice so that we're ready for the exam. So let's go ahead and do that. So, let's go ahead and take a look at this molecule right here. Now, <clears throat> what I want to always try to emphasize when it comes to cyclic and linear structures is you can never, what I call, bleed into or out of a ring structure. Either the ring is the parent structure or it is going to be treated as a substituent. So part of the search for the parent chain is to not only find the longest chain, but to you know, decide whether it is a cyclic structure or a linear structure. And what it's going to come down to is the length of the chain still and where the primary functional group is. Now, on this structure, we only have two functional groups. We have this double bonded oxygen, which next to it only has two carbons, which means that it's a ketone. And we have this carbon right here that has an OH on it, which means it's an alcohol. Now, when you go to the chart, I'm not going to bring it up, uh, but you can look it up. Actually, maybe I'll pop it up on the screen. Let's see in, in editing. If so, it'll be right here. And what you'll see on that chart is that the alcohol is lower in priority than the ketone. And so since the ketone is the higher priority group, it's on the ring too. That makes this ring be the parent structure, not this chain. Even though the chain is longer, the presence of the functional group really defines this ring then as the parent chain. So we know that this is going to be the parent that makes this, even though it's longer in number of carbons, this makes this a substituent. Also makes these substituents, and even this functional group, oops, <laughs> a functional group. Now, this is going to be treated as the primary functional group, which means that it doesn't get named as a substituent. It gets named at the end of the parent uh, name. And since it's a ketone, if you look up on the chart, it's called own. So we'll write own for this structure right here. And since it is a cyclic structure, the numbering begins with the one on the primary functional group. That only is true on a cyclic structure. On a linear structure, um, you do have to start your numbering either from one end of the longest chain that you've determined to be the parent or the other end, even if the primary functional group that helped you decide that that was the longest chain is somewhere in the middle. So in the cyclic, though, you always start the one on the primary functional group. Then you still have the choice. Do you go one, two, three, four, five, six, or do you go one, two, three, four, five, six. And so at this point, we don't really um, we don't really look at priority anymore because that was the priority functional group. Now what we do now what we do to determine which one is the uh, correct numbering is because there's no more priority we already did that we made this one that's the only way to low to minimize the priority of the functional of the primary functional group we've done that but there's still two choices for numbering and so it all comes down well there's two remember there's the last resort but first the first point of difference rule which means you collect all the locants and put them in numerical order for both direction. So let's do the green one. So we've got one for the functional group, two, three for the OH, then 
therefore, for both of these methyls, since there's two of them, even though they're the same type of substituent, you don't get to say um, that there's just one, even though they're the same number. You don't just write it once. Because these are independent substituents, even if they're the same type and name, and they each share four as the locant, there's still two of them. So you still have to write four, four. And then this locant is five. And that's it. That's the only substituents with locants. Uh, you would also include unsaturation, too, if there was any of that, uh, the locant that's associated with it. So you collect all those numerically. Then you do the same for this numbering. So 1, then 2, 3, and then 4 for both of the methyls, 4, 4, and then 5 for a hydroxide. So what we find is normally we would find one of these numbers going down. That's why it's called first point. You would go from lowest to highest until you find the first point where there was a difference. There is no difference in this case. And so that's what that last resort is that I mentioned in my lecture video um, that you can find on Blackboard uh, if you're in my course. And so what, what, I, what, what the last resort is, is now it turns out that you've already minimized the locants. That's what this is trying to do. You pick the one where the first point of difference is the lowest, but there is no first point of difference. So there's no way to minimize anymore. There's, we've already minimized the functional group. There's no first point of difference. So the last thing you do, because you can't leave it where um, they're the... the um, you can't leave it where there's two different numbering schemes. The reason you might say, well, what? They're identical. Well, it's going to change the name because in one of these, let's say you pick the green one, hydroxy is going to be numbered three. If you pick the blue one, then hydroxy is going to be numbered five. So what we're going to do instead is we are going to go ahead and assign the names to these substituents. So this is hydroxy. That's the name when it's a substituent. And in one case, well, let's just go ahead and name these first. So these are both methyls. We are going to collect these when we do the final name. But for, for now, let's just call them methyl. Well, you know what? No, let's go ahead and collect them. So since they are identical, we don't leave them as you know, we're not going to name them separately in the name. We're going to combine them. It's not because they're on the same carbon. Oftentimes students think that, that, it's, that because they're on the same carbon, this is why we call it what we're going to write in a moment. But no, it's because wherever you find identical substituents in the molecule, assuming that you have those substituents and they're identical, you collect them all and you, because they all share the same name and you count them. And then you, instead of naming it methyl methyl or having methyl twice in the name, you just say dye. Methyl. And like I said, it doesn't have to be they're on the same carbon. They could be on different carbons. And because they can be on different carbons, you do have to identify where these two, which is the dye, methyl is at on the parent ring. And so they're both at the four carbon. That's what these locants are. That's what the numbering is. It's telling us which carbon these groups are at. It's at the four carbon, these two methyls. And some students think they can just write four dimethyl. And while you could probably assume the absence of a number meant that both of the, met the methyls shared the four. Um, the official IUPAC is you have to write all locants, even if they're identical. And so it's for four dimethyl. And this has one, two, three, four, five, six, seven carbons. So seven is hept. And remember, heptane, if it was a chain. If it was a, if we were naming it as a parent compound, it would be heptane. But because it is a substituent, because it is a piece that's off of another molecule that we're naming as a parent, we call it um, heptyl. And it's at the five. Oh wait, we haven't gotten to numbering yet. Uh, I did do the 4-4, four, four, but that's okay because they're identical in these two systems. But before I number, let's change to the coloring scheme because it matters. So either this is going to be 3 heptyl or it's going to be 5 heptyl. And either this is going to be 3. Oops, nope, blue. This is the correct color. Is. Either this is going to be 5 heptyl, uh, hydroxy or it's going to be 3 hydroxy. So the way you determine it is it all, it is all based on 
the alphabetical order in this case. And so we have hydroxy, heptyl, dimethyl. You don't look at the di because that's a prefix. You look at the M still for alphabetizing the, the substituent names. And so M is going to go last. H is going to come before it. Both of these are H. However, if you remember how to alphabetize, once you know that they have the same first letter, then you move on to the next one, E versus Y, the E is going to be lower. So heptyl is going to go first. Therefore, we want to minimize this number in the name because that's the last option or that's the last thing you worry about. Many students get confused. They start to want to do that for everything. This is a, this is a, these rules are in order of when you activate them. So you don't try to minimize the function, uh, not functional, but the substituent that is first alphabetically in the name, unless it is the last resort. Before that, you try to minimize and determine which of these uh, numbering directions is best by finding a first point of difference where when you find the first difference you pick the number uh, of the two options that is lowest and then that determines which numbering scheme you pick. But when that fails you move on to alphabetize the order. And before that even sometimes it may even be that in order to minimize the locant for the functional group that doesn't happen in cyclic naming because you always just get to pick them as one but in linear molecules when they're the parent and you have a functional group on them, oftentimes the two options, because in linear molecules, you'll find there's only two ways to number. Either, if let's say this was a parent compound, it would either be one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, or it'd be one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. You don't get to start the numbering in the middle. End to end when it's a linear molecule. So, in, in those cases, but yeah, in those cases, not so much in cyclic, but in linear ones, you oftentimes can uh, narrow down the locant numbering based on which one of the directions minimizes the functional group number. And then once you have to, you know, once you determine that only one of them, you know, usually only one of them does it, not always, there is some, some symmetrical molecules where uh, either direction has the same number for the locant for the functional group. But except for those rare exceptions, that usually narrows it down. And then you don't even have to worry about first point of difference or um, about what the what the number of the um, first substituent is alphabetically. Now, once we've determined the numbering, we can now uh, begin to name this alphabetically, if you recall. So first, this is the first one overall. So it's, what did we determine? Three. So three, oops, heptal. Next is hydroxy, so five hydroxy, then four, four di methyl, and then last is the actual parent name, which is a six membered ring. So it's six carbons, which means hex, but because it's a cyclic structure, we always call those parent names cyclohex. And then if it was no functional group and no unsaturation, it would be hexane with an A-N-E. But because, um, so it would be hexane and then I would put an E, but because um, there is no unsaturation, we leave the A-N. And because there is a functional group, instead of the E, we put the functional group pre, uh, suffix, O-N-E. And so the name of this compound is 3 heptyl 5-hydroxy-4-4-dimethylcyclohexanone. I think I'll end for this video and then maybe make another one instead of just trying to force it all in one. I hope that was helpful. Maybe I'll do another one.